Good evening, IG family. Sunday night check-in. Come on in, come on in. Hope all of you are well. I know I am coming on tonight a little bit later than normal. Sunday night check-in. Uh, see, we have some regulars coming on in. How are y'all doing tonight? Monique Jasmine. Minister Sharon. Stephen. Come on in. Come on, come on in. Good evening. How are y'all doing? How are y'all doing this Sunday evening? How are you all doing? It's a good day. Today is March 21st, 2021. Coming on a little later tonight, one of my best friends from college. Um, we've been friends for 30 years. It's, been, it's a crew of us. It's four of us deep in that crew that has um, walked together and lived life together as adults, from young adults on to midlife. And so tonight was her 50th birthday celebration. And so uh, coming in a little late to get started tonight. <clears throat> I don't know why I need a little water. Oh, I see my sister, the prophetess on here, prophetess Grant, how are you doing this evening? <clears throat> All of a sudden I needed to cough. And my eyes are getting a little watery. Yes, I'm excited for Soul Care. I miss our Monday nights too. Good evening, Mark Hinton. Uh, good evening to the American Church Loans. I see that name. Good evening, Tanya, Kayla. So as I was stating when I was coming on, I'm on a little later. Good evening, Marcy. I saw you earlier today. On my husband's live, I don't know how many of you got on earlier today with Pastor Dobbins. Um, I was trying to figure a way from my end, even though I was at home and he was not at home, to end his live at certain points. Yes, the glory of the Lord fell, but for those of you who were on there, you know, he started talking about grown people stuff. I'm going to say it that way. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Come on in. So I'm going to get started here tonight. For those of you who don't know, I've been doing uh, Sunday night check-ins for a while now. I think when I looked in the series, when I posted last week, uh, his live was amazing, though, earlier. You're right. His live was amazing talking about love. Um, and then the glory of the Lord fell at the end. And, you know, honestly, I'm going to put this shameless plug out there. Most people um, know my husband. They know he is a great teacher of the word. He's a preacher of the word. He is a person that loves everyone. He has the gift of exhortation. Now he's joined. I just pray that he doesn't cut up in my comments, but he's, he's joined and now I'm getting ready to uh, expose him a little bit. But when the glory of the Lord fell on that live with him earlier today, hey, Tracy, um, I, I really wanted him to go all the way in. I don't know that many people have really experienced him go all the way in. And I don't know that many people understand the real gifting that is on his life and who he is. He's a teacher. He's a preacher. He's also a motivator. He That is part of what he does. Even for our son, our youngest son here for football, some of his friends start relying or asking Joshua, hey, send us those videos your dad sent us uh, to motivate them. But what most people do not know about him is that he is a, see a seer. Hey, Shauna, uh, he is a seer. And so if you don't understand what I mean by that terminology, in the Old Testament, um, some prophets were called seers and some actually would hear the Lord. So uh, David had uh, a seer and a prophet assigned to him. Nathan could hear and speak to him and other prophets around him were seers and they would articulate or convey to him that which they would see. My husband is a seer. He can hear, but uh, in its fullness of what a seer is, he is a seer. He is able to see a thing before it happens, when it's happened or in the past that it's happened. And so I really wish <laughs> um, 
Oh, we can't have him join right now. We don't know what that would look like. He's in the other room. Uh, he and the youngest son are getting ready to get some um, ice cream. You know, when you all preach a lot in the house, that's their way of taking a break. Oh, you're going live? We're going to go get some ice cream. But anyway, um, he is a seer. And so when the Holy Spirit fell on him, I was like, Lord, I really want to tell him, just go for it. Because I know the way his gifting is, when just looking at your names in the comments, he can just start flowing and the Holy Spirit will give him a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge or a word of prophecy, which I, I hope you all know that those are three different things. Prophecy is foretelling. A word of wisdom is a supernatural answer to a natural response. And a word of knowledge is when you encounter someone who did not know you or did not know certain things about you and the Holy Spirit reveals it to those that person. So if someone walks up to you and begins to convey to you what happened to you when you were five and that this happened in your family when you were 10 and they did not know you, that is a word of, of knowledge. Uh, if someone come, begins to speak to you and give you solutions and strategies from the Lord, uh, and that is actually something you've been praying about. It's a supernatural response to a natural problem, meaning it's not something your natural mind could come up with or could um, articulate even that the Holy Spirit had to reveal it. And when they begin to walk in that word of wisdom, they can provide um, a strategy. I, I just I don't know why to keep using that word. It's not just limited to a strategy, but I'm sensing somebody's been praying for a strategy. And so that's what a word of wisdom is. Prophecy is foretelling, uh, foretelling. And so oftentimes we get them confused or we just label everything as a prophecy when some things are not a prophecy. Uh, some things are, I know we've said things like prophecy has to be confirmed. That if you get a prophetic word, it should be a confirming word. Uh, that's not actually a scripture, and I understand why people say that, that oftentimes it is a confirming word, but that may not happen 100% of the time. When we look biblically, we don't see that when the angel came and spoke to Mary and told her she was going to be pregnant by the Holy Ghost, we don't see in scripture where that was a confirming word. That's why he had to begin and tell her, don't fear. Uh, he, had to, he, had to, he had to prep her for what he was going to convey to her and tell her so that she could receive it. And so oftentimes we'll say this word is not really a prophetic word because that's not a confirming word. It's not a word that I've heard before, but every prophetic word, everyone that's a true prophet knows that every time God gives you a prophetic word, it does not necessarily mean that that is something that someone has heard before. It does not necessarily mean that God is confirming your dream. It does not mean that. And so we have to, and I keep trying to fight and I didn't even plan to start here tonight. I keep resisting teaching something on prophecy, but it is it's needed because it is widely being misused and people have become more attached to prophecies than they have the written word of God. If you want to know more about who God is, how God operates, how God's his character and, and what God believes or says about a thing, you start with the word of God. You don't live your life based on prophecy. We don't live according to the prophetic. We live according to the logos, the written word of God. Let me tell you why. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I have to have the word in order to increase my faith. That's how faith comes. Cometh, E-T-H. All of your Christian walk, faith will continually be coming. It is going to continue. Listen, in order for you to have faith, it has to be a, a continuation. Listen, I'm, listen what I'm saying. You don't have faith or you don't uh, increase your faith by what you heard in the past. You increase your faith by what you are hearing. That's why as children of God, we have to always be in a posture and position to continually hear the word of God because faith comes cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And in order to please God, the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. So while we're trying to check all, uh, you know, uh, cross all these boxes off, I didn't cuss today. I didn't sin today. I didn't do all these things. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. There are many people who have lived moral lives, but do not have faith in God. They just had discipline in their own lives. Unfortunately, there are many people on the other end of the spectrum who are people of faith who don't have the morality 
reality as some people, I, I don't even know where we're going with this. This was nothing I planned on talking about tonight. I was getting ready to talk to you about my friend's 50th birthday party. But, but faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so going back to the prophetic word, the gifting that is on my husband, oftentimes he does not go forth or showcase in that because I want to use that word. Sometimes people showcase their gifts in order to draw people unto them rather than using the gift when at the time that God says it's appropriate to use it in order for the gifting now to operate at its maximum capacity and have the most effectiveness in the lives of of the believers. They throw their gifts out there and they lead with their gifts so that you understand that they are gifted and they want you to follow them and come after them because they are gifted. But yet it is not even their gift. It is a gift that has been given to them. And if any of you have the uh, the Holy Spirit, you have access to the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are not... Um, just for one or two people. It is for everyone who has the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So if you're just joining us, we're started off talking about my husband's live earlier. And even though parts of it was comedic, comedic during the day, you should really listen to it. He was giving a recap of our pastor and just talking about love and how love um, gives and lust takes. And I know when we think of the word lust, we oftentimes think of sex, but lust is not just uh confined to sexual sins. Lust is lusting after a ministry not, that's not yours. Lusting after a business or wanting or desiring a business that's not yours. It's an improper uh, use of your affection and your desires. It is actually the opposite of love. Love gives, lust takes. So I was talking about Pastor Dobbins and I was talking about how the Holy Spirit fell at the end of his life and how I know the gifting that is upon him because he is a seer that he would be able to just look at the names and the Holy Spirit just begin to tell him things or give him answers, uh, not for him, but for the body of Christ. And perhaps at one season in time, the Lord would allow him to go forth in that capacity. But you have to understand that when you have been given a gift of that magnitude, it is crucial that you steward it in a way uh, that that uh, glorifies God. And you have to be careful that that gifting is grounded. Thank you, Holy Spirit, with the word of God. Oftentimes, too many people prophesy or, 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 or prophets or use the gift of prophecy, but it is not grounded in the word of truth. That's what the Bible is. That's why it's important. The Bible tells us that prophecies may fail, but the word of God, the, the grass may wither and the flower, the flower may fade, but before one word, before one jot, one tittle of the word will pass away or fail. And so that was the crash course on a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge and prophecy and and how sometimes we use those words interchangeably when actually they all have their individual use, uh, their individual definitions, if you will. And so they're not necessarily synonymous, though we sometimes try to use them interchangeably in the body of Christ. But it is simply because many people don't know. Many people don't understand the function of um, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and the full function of prophecy. Everybody wants a prophetic word, but they necessarily don't understand the scope and the full function of why God even has prophets. Listen, I'm, I, I promise you, this is not where I was going, but let me back up for a minute. When we look in the Old Testament and we look at uh, Samuel, who was established the office of the prophet. Moses was a prophet, but the office of a prophet was established by Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, you can read those books, but Samuel was unique in this way. He was raised up in the temple. He was in a priesty, priestly lineage, which means he was of a tribe uh, that of priests of Levi. He was raised up in the temple, trained in the order of a priest. He was the one to establish the office of a prophet, and he was the last and final judge. He was the last of one um, era judges, and he was the beginning of the next, which was to establish the office of the prophet 
and to teach and train other prophets. He created the school of the prophets. And so when we look at, at, at the prophets of old, their functions were actually a little different than what you will see in the New Testament because you don't really see people going around after the Holy, um, after the church is established. You don't really see them saying the prophet Peter or all of these, they were all called apostles. You don't really see them functioning or using those titles, but that is because during that dispensation or that time, they all had access to the gift of prophecy because they all were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In the Old Testament, God was only speaking to certain ones. Right now, in the era in which we live, if you have received the baptism, the infilling, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you have access to hear from God. Yes, we still need prophets because prophets guide us with the word of the Lord. However, you should be able to even in your home, hear God for yourself. I really wasn't going to talk about prophets tonight. I really came on to, to, to be consistent, first of all, and talk about um, come on Sunday night check in. As I started saying earlier, I believe when I uploaded my video last week, I was at either 18 or 19. So I think I've missed maybe two or three uh, Sundays. But I have 19 weeks or that, that 19 means a, a week's worth uh, every Sunday, uh, indicating at the beginning of a new week uh, of uploads from doing Sunday night check ins. So that's about 20, 20 weeks. And so we've been faithful to continue to come before you on Sunday nights. Not just to check in and let you know how we're doing, but to check in and see how you're doing. To check in and see if you've still been faithful. This is if you've still been committed, if you've still been consistent, if you've still been moving courageously in 2021. I understand that 2021 has somewhat began like uh, 2022.0, but it's still important for us to be consistent, to go forth and, and, and be courageous in all that God has called us to do and to establish commitment and order in our life. Listen, there is something that, that commitment will get you. Some of you are trying to build and some of you are trying to create and establish things, and it's going to take commitment. It's going to take diligence. It's going to take consistency. It's going to take showing up at the same time. You know, we understand that if we work for somebody else that we have to check in and we have to work eight to five or whatever that time frame is. But how many of us has God given us something and he's put in our hands and we have been consistent to ourselves and committed to ourselves to do all that God has called us to do. And so I'm just here tonight to remind you that he who has begun a good work in you, he shall perform it, but he's also going to require your participation. This past uh, Saturday, and I'm going to be transparent now, this past Saturday, uh, we had Closing the Gap. For those of you who don't know, last week, my family and I went to, on spring break, it was our youngest son's spring break, we went to Miami, we went to Florida, uh, I think now they're on shutdown due to some things, but praise the Lord that wasn't going on while we were there and we came in on Friday, but before, right before I was leaving for Miami on last week on Sunday, I'm, I'm talking to you about consistency now on Sunday, I received a phone call Well, my husband and I received a, a text. Uh, from one of my childhood friends who happens to be a male, but who has met my husband in diff in, um, uh, you know, since we've been married and my husband has preached, um, for, for the church where he's a deacon. He's brought my husband in to speak to their men's ministry several times. And so he texts my husband and myself on the same text and he, he let us know that his mother was possibly, well, he had texted a few days before saying that his mother was going to possibly transition. And so on Sunday, he let us know that she had transitioned. Um, and that they were having a funeral on Saturday, March the 20th, and they wanted me, um, to, to participate in the service. And so immediately my heart went out cause I grew up with him and his brother. Um, and my heart went that went out and immediately my heart went out for him, for them. Um, my heart also said we have closing the gap on March 20th. We already had postponed closing the gap, which was supposed to have been on March 6th due to another death. And so 
The Holy Spirit just dropped it quickly. I began to get on my phone. I began to send out text messages, text a, a pastor. And I said, listen, uh, I have to be at a funeral on Saturday, but I also need to to have closing the gap on Saturday. And the only way I can do that is if you will allow us to come into your building on Friday night and, and record and have closing the gap. And we will premiere it live on Saturday because I have already committed to closing the gap. We've postponed it once. I don't want to postpone it again because honestly postponing it again will cause us to miss the entire month of March. And so I began to get on my phone. I had to contact musicians. I had to contact the, the, the people with the building, the pastors with the building. And I'm going somewhere with this. Um, and everything fell in line. And I had to contact my team. Can you be available? So listen to me. This is what sometimes what con commitment and consistency looks like. We got on a, listen, I'm going to just give you last weekend what last weekend looked like. Uh, Friday, probably Friday, I'm not sure, Friday the 12th, I went to East Texas to check on my aunt. Saturday the 13th, that was three hours there, three hours back in one day. Saturday the 13th, we drove for my mother in love to get married. Five hours one way, five hours back. We came back in the middle of the night so that Pastor Dobbins could be at church Sunday morning. We get packed on Sunday. On Monday, we leave for Miami. On Friday, we get back around 11 o'clock a.m. We hit the road running. We hit the ground running. We have all these things to do because at 7 o'clock that night, I've got to go have service and preach closing the gap for Saturday. And then I got to get up Sunday, Saturday morning and drive to my hometown, uh, which is about an hour and 30 minutes away from my house, and then participate in a service. That's what sometimes we, you know, I get it. People tell you you have to rest and you do need balance. But every now and then the call of God and the commitment costs you something. And I just want to talk to someone who feels like you have to keep going and you have to keep going. I want you to understand that God is going to reward you for your faithfulness. And on, on when we had closing the gap, the wind of the Holy Ghost blew in that room. The wind of the Holy Ghost blew so and the power and the anointing was in the room so strong uh, that God's seal of approval for us pressing through and us being consistent and us being committed to do what he had called us to do, really fill the room and people have been blessed. We aired it on Saturday. We premiered it live, which a lot of churches do that. Uh, we premiered it live, but I did not want the people to have to miss what God was saying. And I'm telling you, the power of the Holy Ghost fell in that room the weight of his glory. We just sat around afterwards. We really couldn't even move fast to get out of the room. We, even though we had some things we had to, to wrap up and finish afterwards, we, the weight of the glory was in the room. And the, and some of my mentees began to joke because even the prophetic worship that began to fall, and I'm not a singer. You already know that I have this raspy preacher's voice. I didn't always have this raspy preacher's voice, but I have this raspy preacher's voice and the flow of the Holy Ghost began to just come into the room uh, and they said, Elder Dobbins, you went to Miami and came back with a flow. I don't know what happened, but I know that the oil was in the room and that the anointing that destroys the yokes. And so I want to tell you all, if you can go to my public Facebook page and watch sa uh, Saturday's Closing the Gap. It's posted from March the 20th. The power of the Lord will meet you there. But I want to talk to you a little bit about what I discussed. I'm going to give you almost kind of like a cliff notes. I talked about the daughters of Zelophehad uh, being that this uh, from Numbers chapter 27. And I understand this is Women's History Month and we're coming to the close of that. And I am a person that believes and supports women. I believe that women should be treated equally because I believe that God created us equal because in the beginning, Adam was male and female. So there was no difference in us in the beginning. God then put Adam to sleep and he took woman out of man. But listen, we still all were told to be fruitful and to multiply. We still were both given authority and given dominion. It is once that sin entered and they disobeyed that, that, that part of what was told to the woman is now that her desire would be to her husband. But that was just really God establishing order. He didn't mean that her desire would be to her husband at the expense of what he created her to do. He didn't mean that her desire would be to her husband 
and her children and that there was no purpose for her in this earth. No, that was the trick of the enemy that began to try to devalue women. And, and, I, and I, I like to say it like this, and I said this on Saturday when you go back and listen, that the enemy's attack against men was always up front. You knew from time to time that there was a, a hit out on men, that when Moses was a baby, there was a hit out on male born children, the Hebrews two and under. When Jesus was born, there was another, we're gonna kill all of them two and under. And we understand that the enemy always wants to kill the man because he wants to take away the head, those that are in authority. But listen to me, his attack on women was much much more subtle. He began to devalue women. He began to degrade women. Even throughout the Bible, even throughout the Old, Old Testament, oftentimes you saw that the way the enemy fought against women was that we were deceived. And so the enemy's attack against man was straightforward. Let's kill all the male babies to and under. And you knew they were after the male seed. But the attack on women was much uh, was much more subtle. He was more, much more deceptive. He fought us in low self-esteem, in devaluing us, in degrading us, in treating us like property. Even if you go back to the Old Testament, attaching our value and our worth only to our womb that we were able to either procreate or not procreate. And oftentimes we still are played with some of those things in 2021. So while I am a proponent of women, I cannot fully align myself up with other movements movements for women because they are not totally in alignment with the word of God. So when I talk about the daughters of Zelophehad in Numbers chapter 27, these are five women who first of all understood who they were. When they went to Moses and they began to make a petition uh, to Moses on behalf of their father who was deceased. They said, listen, why should our father's name be blotted out uh, in history, basically, just because he has no male heirs? We are his father, we are his daughters, and we deserve his inheritance. And so I appreciate the fact, first of all, let me set the setting of where this is. This was between the children of Israel leaving Egypt and going into the promised land. This is when the children of Israel were in transition transition. Uh, they were tr in transition from being slaved enslaved to now going into their full freedom. And this is some of the order that had to be established. Moses had to uh, begin to allocate the land appropriately according to the tribes. There were 12 tribes of Israel and the daughters of Zelophehad were of the tribe of Manasseh. And so when they went to Moses, the first thing that I want to identify is they didn't go alone. One didn't go, two didn't go, three didn't go, or they didn't go as individuals they went as a collective unit. And while I'm talking about the daughters of Zelophehad, I want you to understand that the church is female because she is the bride of Christ. What God wants to do for us in this season, because we are in a season of transition, we may not understand it. We may not recognize it. God is raising up some. He's putting down another. Even in denominations all throughout the land, leadership is transitioning. Leadership is changing hands. And if you're watching and paying attention, even with some of our greats, our generals who are passing away, there is a season of transition. What I appreciate about the daughters of Zelophehad is when they went to Moses, they didn't go in identifying who they were as individuals. They went in their father's name. They knew who they were because they knew who their father was and they went in the strength of their name. It is not um, an indictment on me as a woman to come in the name of my father. See, the problem I have with some movements is, and this is not what I planned on talking about either, is I, I am very much for women being treated equal, but I am not for elevating a woman at the expense of a man because God is the God of order. My husband, whether I agree, whether I disagree, whether I like it, whether I do not like it, according to scripture, is the head of my house. Now listen, some people get it confused because they begin to think that man is the head of woman. But no, the scripture says that the husband is the head of the wife, not just a woman, not just a random woman, not just someone walking by because he's a man. Uh, she has to do what he says. No, the husband is the head of the wife. But these daughters, these five daughters went in the strength 
of their father's name. We as the bride of Christ, the bride being the female side, the bride of Christ, we are going to have to go back to being unified like these women. We're trying to come in all our individual uh, sex. We like not S-E-X, S-E-C-T-S. We trying to come in, in all our individuality, our denominations, our non-denominations. We believe this way. We believe that way. Actually, our strength is going to come when we are unified and we're all coming in the name of our father. The daughters of Zelophehad went to Moses and said, listen, we need you to give us of, of our inheritance. Just because our father had no sons does not mean that uh, his name should be blotted out. And when they went to Moses, is they also brought up that our father died, but he did not die as part of those who were in rebellion against you. You have to go and read um, uh, Numbers chapter 27, and they re refer to a rebellion or insurrection, if you will, that ha had occurred previously. And they wanted him to know, no, they, he wasn't part of that. He died, just he died. He died on his own. And so they present the case to Moses. What I respected about Moses, because what good leadership does, especially in the body of Christ, they don't just look at how tradition always did it. Moses could have said, tradition says that uh, only men or males can be heirs. But Moses consulted the Lord. I appreciate leadership that understands even though I am, I am in authority, I am still under authority. So Moses didn't just exercise his authority without consulting the ultimate authority who ultimately wasn't just the father in the spirit of the daughters of Zelophehad, but was also Moses' father. So he goes and consults with the Lord and the Lord tells him the women are right. And I'm paraphrasing all of this. The women are right. So he goes back and tells them, you're right. And what God does now, because this group of women spoke up, now he's, Moses is instructed to change the entire law. To now say, if a man does not have a male heir, that it can now be passed to his daughters. All because five women were unified. Five women had their identity in their father. They had their identity in their father's name, in the name of their household. Five women. But listen to me. When you, when you read this in Numbers chapter 27, it says they went to the door of the tent of meeting. That Moses was there. Eliezer, the priests were there. The princes were there. And the entire congregation. I... Listen, they went and the house was packed, but they didn't try to go in. They didn't try to barge in. They didn't try to go in and take over. They went and spoke to the one who was the decision maker at the door, at the point of entry. They spoke to Moses. I just want to tell somebody, you keep trying to run all the way into the room, but all you have to do is get to the door. You keep trying to join the congregation or become one of the princes that's in the room, but all you have to do is get in front of the one who makes the decisions, the one who is in charge, the one who is the authority, the one who is in leadership, the one who hears from God. Oftentimes when we see people, we tend to think we need to connect to everyone around them in order to get to them. But God is saying, I need you to know that I'm a God of order. Moses was the one that they needed to entreat. So Moses was the only one that they talked to. They didn't go and try to talk to anyone else. They went to the door. They went to the point of entry and they spoke to Moses. Somebody needs, we've been talking all year about three things, courage, commitment, and consistency. Somebody needs the courage to go to the point of entry, to speak to the one who's in charge. Mm, I'm not trying to go there tonight, but I, what I hear in my spirit is this. Mm, you've been asking the wrong people. You've been asking those who can't even give you the answer. You've been asking those who have not even been authorized or don't even have the authority. You've been talking to those who perhaps have the ear of leadership, but they do not represent leadership. See, I can have the, I can know leadership. I can work with leadership. I can serve leadership, but not necessarily be have influence with leadership. You've been talking to some of those who are around leadership, but you need to have the courage to speak to the leader. Fast forward. 
Because everybody knows the stories of the daughters of Zelophehad. And I was just giving you a cliff note of what I preached on Saturday. And I really want you to go and listen to the totality of it. Because there are several things that happen. Okay, I'm going to come back. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There are several things that happen in Numbers chapter 27. I, I explained to you that they were in transition. When you read the last few verses of Numbers chapter 26, it, it tells you that those who were the ones who wandered in the, uh, the Israelites, who had wandered in the wilderness around and around, that they had all died off and now they are in transition and they are getting ready to leave where they are and they're headed to the promised land so they're in between they're in between the promise they haven't quite attained the promise they're no longer in Egypt but they have not yet put their hands on the promise of God yet and so another thing that happens when you get down to about numbers chapter 18 number 27 verses 18 through 23 the Lord commands Moses to call up and bring forth Joshua and bring Joshua before the people and bring Joshua before the people. And the Bible says, I like how it says, put some of your honor on Joshua. And basically what happens is Moses anoints Joshua in front of the people. And he, the Bible says it that way, put some of your honor, that's King James, on Joshua, which means he is now anointing him as his successor in front of all the people who already honor Moses. And Moses publicly putting the blessing on Joshua now causes Joshua to receive the honor that was once on Moses. He is setting the people up because Moses already knows I'm not going to get to the promised land, but now I'm raising up the leader who is going to walk you all the way through. There are several things that happen in Numbers 26 while they are in transition. Listen, anytime you're in transition and it's Numbers chapter 27. Someone put uh, 13 or 18 in the comments, but it's actually Numbers chapter 27. Anytime you're in transition, you, you sometimes lose things and, and we've taught it from that way before, but the Lord showed me, no, but these, these women, the daughters of Zalatha had, they, they, they received their inheritance in the middle of transition. Transition, transition feels unstable at times it, because we're not quite there. We know where God said we're going, but we haven't quite made it. And so sometimes it feels uh, uneasy. It feels unstable. And so we are not generally by nature comfortable with instability. But a lot happened in that Numbers 27. There was a transfer of power at the end and it all happened in transition. Fast forward to Numbers chapter 36. Some of the men of the tribe of Manasseh bring it to Moses' attention. Okay, you're going to give these ladies, the daughters of Zelophehad, their father's inheritance. We just want to make sure that when these women marry, that they marry within the tribe so that the inheritance of our tribe does not now transfer to another tribe. I'm going to say that again. The men went before Moses and they said, some of the men of the tribe of Manasseh, and they said, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, okay, these young ladies, you're going to give the daughters of Zelophehad their father's inheritance. But we are concerned that when these five ladies get married, the portion of their inheritance that came from the portion of the entire tribe of Manasseh. Now, if they marry someone outside of the tribe, then now that portion belongs to another tribe. And Moses agreed with them and said, you're right. So let's set it in order that the daughters of, 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 of Zelophehad have to marry within their own tribe. And if a woman gets an inheritance, they have to marry within their own tribe so that the inheritance stays with the tribe. And that's very interesting because the daughters of Zelophehad not only receive their inheritance, but they also all receive, when you go to Numbers 36, they all received or all became married. And even in them being married, um, they still had, I don't know how to say this without kind of sounding real old school. The promises of God, yes, they are, they are yea and amen in him. 
But every now and then, when you have a promise, there is a, con a clause, a contingency clause. And so the contingency clause on this was, yes, you can now qualify for the inheritance, but you cannot commingle outside of your crowd. Somebody, listen to me, what this is really saying is whatever it is God has for you, he does not intend for you to go and give your uh, what your inheritance to someone outside of the kingdom. Listen, I, I'm trying to say this the way I really, I really heard this. Um, these ladies had to stay within their tribe because first of all, before it was allocated to their father, there was a portion allocated to the entire tribe. We have all made all the comments that we want to make, and I, I, I'm not here to debate anything about um, what's going on uh, with the royal family. I'm not here to discuss all of that. What I am here to say is, in America, we don't understand what kingdom looks like. And so that's actually just a natural picture of part of what we are witnessing is when one party steps outside of the kingdom. And I'm giving a natural example. I'm not giving my opinion. When one party steps outside of the kingdom, you don't you no longer have the benefits of the kingdom. I want you to catch that. You no longer have the benefits of the kingdom because you have stepped outside of the kingdom. So it would be like you coming and receiving Jesus. And now you're part of the kingdom of God. And if you choose to walk away you no longer have the benefits that are in the kingdom. The Bible says, bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits. There are benefits that come along with being a child of God. So how does that transfer to the daughters of Zelophehad? Yes, they were allowed to take their inheritance, but there was a contingency clause on how to maintain their inheritance. And that's what God is wanting to tell somebody. The promises of God are yea and amen in him. He has the promised land. You're in transition. Somebody's in transition right now. You're just about to obtain the promise, but there is a contingency clause. God wants to make sure that that which he deposits in you stays within the kingdom. That's why when God gives you a gift and raises you up, it is not for you to allow it to be contaminated by outsized forces, but it is for the uplifting and the building of the kingdom. Sometimes we get it backwards. The Bible says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. Sometimes we are the just and feel like we need the confirmation or the affirmation of the world. But God is saying there is a contingency clause that yes, the inheritance is yours. Yes, he wants you to go to the door and get it. But when you get it, you have to use it for the kingdom. It has to stay within the kingdom. It is not for the contamination. It is not for the world to do what they want want to do with it. It is for the kingdom. It's for the kingdom. Whatever you do, it's for the kingdom. Whatever gift you have, it's for the upbuilding and uplifting of the kingdom of God on this earth. Whatever it is, I don't care if you're an artist. I mean, like an artist who draws or an artist who paints. Whatever it is, it is for the kingdom. And I want you to know, I don't know why I need to say this to somebody, that God play, pays better than the devil. Sometimes we think we have to take our gifts and our talents somewhere else in order for them to be appreciated or, or in order for them to be valued monetarily. But I want you to understand that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and God pays better than the devil. Always, always, always. It's for the kingdom. That gift to speak is for the kingdom. The gift to write is for the kingdom. The gift to gather people, you are the person, let me show you how to flip it. You are the person in the world who could have all the biggest house parties back when we could gather. Wherever you were, uh, there was a party. Wherever you were, people wanted to be. When you get saved and come into the kingdom, God wants to flip that and use that for the kingdom. That people will now come to God because you used to draw them to you or draw them to the party or draw them to the club, but now you're drawing them to him. Whatever the gift is, see if somebody is overlooking the gift, you're saying, because I'm not a preacher, I don't have a gift. I'm not a singer, I don't have a gift. I don't write, I don't write books, but I hear that. It's your personality. It's because you are what the Bible says, you're easily to be entreated, that people are comfortable around you. People will listen to you. People will value you because you make them feel comfortable around you and you make it uh, easy, thank you, Lord, to be around you. God wants to use that for the kingdom.
you may, maybe you didn't know, but you, you could possibly, possibly be the greatest evangelist of our time because that thing in you that they called charisma in the world and that they caused and they used for their benefit, it can flip into the kingdom and the anointing get on it and it draws souls all over the world. It's for the kingdom. There's a contingency clause. It is your inheritance and there is the inheritance for the church right now. And whether we know it, the church is in transition. The generals keep dying. The, the generals of our faith, the, the, the great preachers, the great teachers, the great armor bearers, the great deacons, they, the ones who have been committed, the ones who have been what the old church called holding up the bloodstained banner, they're fading. They're leaving. And we're in transition. Who's going who's gonna to fill those posts? God is looking for someone who understands the contingency clause. That yes, it's your inheritance. Yes, it's even your time to get your inheritance. It is even your season to get your inheritance. Yes, you have now unified to the point to go forth, not, and you understand now that it's not about you. You've humbled yourself to understand, I'm going to come in the strength of my father's name. It's not by power, but not by might, but by the spirit of the living God. You've now come to a point, but there's still a contingency clause to say whatever he gave you, it stays within the kingdom. It stays within the kingdom. It stays within the kingdom. The world will see it. Come on. The world will see it, but it's for the kingdom. The world will see it, but it's for the kingdom. The world will see it, but it's for the kingdom. And God's going to use it to draw souls to the kingdom. That's why we do what we do. This, at the end of the day, is about souls coming to the kingdom. I have consistently come on here for 20 weeks or so on a Sunday night because once the soul gets into the kingdom, they need to be discipled. They need to be disciplined in the things of the Lord. We do what we do for the kingdom. We understand who the king is, and we understand that this is the king's domain kingdom. This is the king's domain. We understand that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We understand, thank you Holy Ghost, that the kingdom is now resident within us and that wherever we go, we show up looking like the kingdom. We show up acting like the kingdom. We show up and we present the kingdom. People are hurting all over this world. And God is looking for his image bearers to raise up and represent the kingdom. People are going to come to you and seek you out. Hear me by the word of the Lord and seek you out now more than ever. They're, they're looking for a place, a place of hope, a place of love, a place of security. And they're looking for consistency in this inconsistent world. They're looking for you to show forth the kingdom. Last night, I was taking some bags out of my car and sometimes for me, that's my getaway to just go to the store. And I don't mean like to shop for clothes or something. I just go shop for, during, pan, during the pandemic, I've come up with another addiction. I'm addicted to buying Lysol wipes and Clorox wipes and Lysol. I now have a whole closet full, more than enough. But now that the, sh the, the shelves have been restocked so, and they're never empty, I still feel compelled to buy them as if they're running out. So I had gone, just kind of perusing through some stores and purchased some things like that and came home. And I was actually on my phone on my earpiece getting out. And my neighbor, who has only said hello to me over the last few years, that's it. Sometimes not even hello. A different culture than me said hello. And I said hello. 
And, and she said, how are you doing? And I said, I'm well, how are you tonight? And in a split second, someone who had not gone into conversation with me began to say, I'm hurting. And she began to talk to me about a relationship she had just ended. And she just went on and went on and went on. She just went on and she went on and she went on. She talked to me almost about 10 minutes. And the call, the person in my earpiece just stopped talking because they realized this conversation was going on and on and on and on. And I said that to say, at the end of it, she began to say how I've watched you and your husband. I've watched you all, how y'all handle one another when you come in and out of the house. I've watched you. Um, I watched you and it gives me hope that I can be in a healthy relationship. People need hope. Honestly, I would have never thought she watched us because we never really, and I'm not going to put it on her, been really friendly. We've just said hi and kept going for, for about two years. She ended the conversation by saying this. Now, what's your name? After she poured out her heart and I said, my name. And I said, now what's your name? And I said, we'll sit down and let's talk soon. People are looking for answers and they're looking for somebody to show forth the kingdom. My husband and I joke because we've lived where we live for, for years now. And we said, praise the Lord. She went here in those, those uh, years we were, you know, getting out the car, yelling at one another and running in the house because people, and I said that for somebody, because I don't want you to think they're perfect people. But the Bible says in 2 Peter 3 and 18 that you grow in grace and his grace is sufficient. So over the years, we all have to be able to look at our, our, our lives and measure growth. That's you to be healthy. When you have a baby, they're, they measure your baby. You take your baby to the hospital. They get to go two months. They go again at four months. They go again at six month, months. And they begin to measure growth. And if they ha are not growing, uh, and if they've not grown and they're not developing according to what they believe, then they say there is something wrong. As believers, we should measure our growth. You don't, if you, if you judge yourself, nobody else will have to. Measure your growth. Look at yourself. And say, I did, I'm, I'm better at this now. Because oftentimes we think we, we just highlight what we don't do right. But I, I hope you can look at your life and track some growth. If not, start tonight. Because she said, I've been watching you all. I watch how you and your husband interact with one another. Now, she's home more and we're home more because of the pandemic. And so... She's like, I watch how you almost never go anywhere without one another. Part of that is because we're in a pandemic. That wasn't, that wasn't always that way because we all had, you know, live, separate lives going here and there to work. But the point is she watched. And the point is the in inheritance is here. What God has for you is here. You're going to have to just go get it. You're going to have to just go get it. You're going to have to have the courage to get it, the courage to ask. Go in the strength of his name, not your name. Go in the power of unity like the daughters of Zalafa had. But remember, there's a contingency clause. Whatever God gave you, it's for the kingdom. Whatever gifting and talent that you have, it's for the kingdom. You know, it's funny because I said this to someone and it could sound real vain. And for those of you, <laughs> those of you who know me, you know, I can be vain. So that's that's OK. But it sounded vain. But it took me a minute to understand that young adults start being attracted to my husband and I uh, when we some years back, almost 10 years when we would speak on panels for singles and part of what would attract some of them that I ended up, particularly the females, I ended up mentoring some of them was because they were like, oh, they're a nice looking couple. And the Lord just said it just as plain as day. Part of what you look like, I even use that to draw people unto me. They think 
they're connecting to you because they're going to get a fine husband like you have a fine husband. And that might, that might say, sound carnal, it might sound funny, but it's true. He said, but I use that to draw them so you can tap into that well on the inside and then give them what they need. God uses everything. Just use it for the kingdom. Use it to uplift and to edify and to build the kingdom of God. I think that's my time tonight. Someone said, ask who? I don't know if you were just... Um, I was trying to give a brief recap of what... Um, I talked about on Saturday with the daughters of Zalafahad. I want to remind you, we're in a season of transition. I want you to pay attention. I want you to be sensitive in the spirit. I want you to pray. Um, pray without ceasing. Pray. This is the time to pray. I don't mean that you have to go pray for an hour. I mean, I want you to consistently pray. There is something that you will get in consistency that, that, that doesn't necessarily happen when you try to pray one hour a day and you can only do that every two weeks. But how about praying 10 minutes a day? Somebody said, don't go. How about praying 10 minutes ago, 10 minutes a day consistently? How about being intentional about the space and the time that you create and establish between you and the Lord? How about preparing a place where he would worship, or I mean, where he would dwell and you would worship? How about preparing a, a, a place for him, ma magnifying him, praising him? He inhabits the praises of his people. But this is a time to pray like never before. This is a time to lean into the power of the Holy Spirit like never before. And this is also the time to go get your inheritance like never before. If you look throughout scripture, if you look throughout scripture, timing is important to God. That's why when the day of Pentecost, the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter two, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, uh, the Bible also talks about when the set time of favor, yea, the set time of favor, there is a set time. Um, the Bible also says, um, you know, we all know Proverbs. I mean, yes, Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, uh, you know, that there is a, a, a time and a purpose. But I just want you to understand that this is a this is a time. This is we talked about this briefly last week or maybe more in depth last week, that it's been a year since many people have been to church. And as we prepare to go back. And I'm not saying my church is going back, so I don't want anybody to say that because I don't know when we're going back. But many churches are going back. And when I say my, I mean the church I attend, not the church, just clarifying. Um, but we're in a season of transition. And as we are transitioning back, we don't fully know what that experience is going to look like. We don't fully know what we've lost in trans transition this last year and what we've gained. It's a time to be prayerful now more than ever. May the Lord bless you real good. I, I want to remind you, if you've not, to please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I want to also remind you that are women. God bless you to my friend, Sister Sharon. Um, Prophetess Sharon, she is a prophet in her own right. Uh, Prophet Sharon Grant, um, I want to remind you to register for Soul Care. The link is in my bio. Early registration ended on this past Friday night. It is a five-week study of, of the soul, the will, the mind, the emotions. What does the Bible say about it? What does God say about it? What is God's intention for your soul? What is the enemy's intention for your soul? Some of some of us, the enemy sought to, to destroy us early in life because he wanted to utterly destroy our soul, our will, our mind, our emotions. If you would like to even um, sponsor someone, someone texted me while I was away last week. Um, and so I put a donation uh, thing on the Eventbrite. I didn't know how to do that. When they texted me and asked me, I was like, I'll have to look it up. I texted one of the girls on my team. 
and we got that done. Uh, so if you even want to do that or and bless someone, if you don't want to attend, this class is for women only because of the subject matter and because I want people to be able to uh, be open and to be completely transparent. I don't want to place vulnerable women in the room with vulnerable men because we don't know what that will, will bring together. Uh, so we're not trying to do that. Um, and so I am expecting an outpouring of, of God's wisdom amongst us for soul care. Uh, he's been he's been speaking to me for months and speaking to my spirit for months. And so um, I'm excited. I'm preparing my soul to pour into your soul, uh, preparing myself because I understand um, the magnitude um, and the importance of this. I want to say this. There is a disclaimer on Eventbrite. This is not licensed professional counseling. This is spiritual guidance. What does the Bible say about your soul? For those of you who have attended the Art of Hearing, we've gotten into some Q&A with some people who uh, have, um, you know, just had life issues that we've they've asked prayer for or we've had to answer questions. And so I do have several licensed professional counselors. I'm going to try to have more by the next week, but I have a couple that I know for sure and I trust them that I have um, on a sidebar referred them, um, someone from my classes to those counselors. They are counselors who are trained naturally. They are licensed, qualified, educated, and they are also spirit filled. And so um, we don't take soul the soul lightly. We don't take mental health lightly, and we understand um, the gravity of all of it. And so we are walking circumspectly as, as it relates to that so that the people of God can receive the totality of what God has for them in this season. God bless you all. Don't forget, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Don't forget, if you have not registered for Soul Care, to register for Soul Care. That class starts on Monday night. March the 29th. May the Lord bless you real good. That's an old song we used to sing. I'm not going to sing it, but may the Lord bless you real good. I spent a lot of time praying that he would. May the Lord God bless you real good. Good night, everyone. God bless you all.